we have no idea why we are here. Some of the greatest minds in the world cannot tell you why we are here. The Big Bang was the moment everything that we know came into existence. Stars, galaxies, the universe, you and I. Yet according to the standard model of physics, nothing should be here. At the moment of the Big Bang, both matter and antimatter blinked into existence in equal amounts. But matter and antimatter can't exist together. The moment it meets, it annihilates itself. So according to what we know about the universe, there should be no matter, no antimatter, just a faint afterglow of energy. A second after the Big Bang, most of the matter and the antimatter did collide and annihilate each other. Yet a small sliver of matter survived and we have no idea why. One of the ideas lies in neutrinos. Neutrinos are popular in this area. You guys have all heard of the Ray Davis Homestick experiment that led to the 2002 Nobel Prize in Physics. The universe is spilling over with neutrinos. They are actually the second most abundant particle in the universe after photons. At any given moment, you have trillions of neutrinos passing through you. Their mass is so small that they effortlessly pass between the spaces of your atoms, rarely colliding with anything. The neutrino may hold a secret, and if we can tease out this secret, it may explain why there is matter in the universe and why we're here. So perhaps the neutrino exists not as the standard model of physics suggests, as a particle and an antiparticle. Perhaps it has a dual nature, a multiple personality, and exists as both its own particle and antiparticle together. If this is the case, then the standard model, the symmetry, is broken, and it will open up the doors to explain why there is matter in the universe when there shouldn't be. So there is a way to see if a neutrino is both a particle and an antiparticle. If something called neutrinoless double beta decay can be observed, then it may open the door to understanding the nature of the neutrino. The problem is, is that neutrinoless double beta decay is incredibly difficult to detect. It is such a vanishingly rare event that you would have to wait one and a third sextillion years for the 50-50 chance that one atom would decay, and you would see it. To surmount this, there are projects we're planning to watch one and a third sextillion atoms all at once for the 50-50 chance that one of those atoms will decay in a year. So this is obviously no trivial task. To see neutrinoless double beta decay, it's very difficult. There's way too much background noise that overshadows this event. So, if you think about it, What's the background noise coming from? It's coming from cosmic radiation and also the radioisotopes that surround us. They're actually in us. You have to go a mile underground. There's so much cosmic radiation on the surface of the Earth, we've actually built the experiment a mile underground to shield it, to decrease it. Then we've gone to great lengths to remove the radioisotopes that surround us. This has been no trivial feat. So just to give you an idea, the Myrana Demonstrator Project, which is going on at Sanford Underground Research Facility, the goal of this is, one of the goals, is to see if we can detect this event. So to do this, we use one of a few different types of elements on the periodic table that can have neutrinoless double beta decay, possibly in it, germanium. So from May 2012 until April of 2017, the Myrana Project assembled 58 germanium detectors that can occur as both the source and the detector for neutrinoless double beta decay, but then also went to extremely great lengths to make sure that they removed all the radioisotopes from the surrounding area, including us. So as you notice, you're going to see the people running around in full suits. So we're not carrying anything in that could cause background noise. We then manufactured everything in-house in terms of cables, the actual chambers, the copper that surrounds the germanium detectors, lead shielding, and then finally polyethylene plastic to seal it up into a large cube where we have silenced everything, the radioisotopes and the cosmic radiation, so that we can see if we can detect this event. Okay. 
Now, why did we go to such a colossal effort to look at a vanishingly rare event that occurs in a single atom? Well, curiosity. We are curious why we are here. We are curious why there is matter in the universe when there shouldn't be. So what is curiosity? Where does it come from? The great evolutionary biologist Theodosius Domanski said, nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. So from an ev evolutionary perspective, curiosity must have had value. If you think about it, it's such a pervasive and dominant feature of human beings, it must have had a purpose. In Darwinian terms, it must have provided a survival advantage. Webster defines curiosity is the desire to know, interest leading to inquiry. But what inspires interest? From the time we are born, we form a view of how the world works. We know that objects are fixed, immutable, they fall, the sun warms us, the sky is blue. If something doesn't fit into this fixed worldview of how we perceive things should behave, our mind defaults to curiosity. We're curious. If I turned into a zebra right now, you'd probably wonder how and why you'd be curious. This has worked out well for humanity. It has propelled us to explore new lands and to innovate new tools and technologies. So think about it. Evolutionary-wise, it's good. It's good to be curious as human beings. I think Kurt Vonnegut said it best. Many profound discoveries actually came while farting around. Einstein actually said that he thought of his theory of relativity while riding his bicycle in circles. In 1945, an engineer at Raytheon who was working on a vacuum tube for a radar-related project actually noticed that the chocolate bar in his pocket melted. That led to the microwave oven. Velcro, penicillin, x-rays, and Viagra were all discovered by accident. Lots of things are inspired by just being curious. Mario Capisi, who won the Nobel Prize in Biology, said of his laboratory, we are always playing. James Watson, the co-discoverer of DNA, said he was able to come up with the structure of DNA before anyone else by playing with models that superficially resembled preschool toys. It's important to be curious. We often hear how poorly our students in America are doing in math and science compared to other countries where they study longer hours and they work harder. And collectively, we are doing worse on standardized tests. But no country has a history of science and technological advances like America. There is something special in our sauce. Curiosity is an extension of innovation and inspiration. Facts are important, but they're static. Textbooks are filled with other people's discoveries. It's outside these textbooks that we see that innovation occurs, assembling old ideas in novel ways. As parents and educators, though, we often define the difference between something that is useful, a child that is doing something useful, and a child that is messing around. So how can we make that different? Well, think of it. In terms of curiosity, a child's mind is hardwired to be curious, to be imaginative, to be creative. They're hardwired to ask why, and we should encourage this. Education should no longer be most imparting of knowledge, but must take a new path seeking the release of human potentialities. My children went to Montessori school through third grade, and it's a much different than traditional setup where schools, where children sit in desks for long periods of time. Often when I would go in, they would be building with blocks, sprawled out on the floor, drawing, doing puzzles. That system encourages curiosity. It doesn't crush it. Many Nobel Prize winners were not fans of school for that very reason, for that crushing, repetitive embedding of knowledge, instead of encouraging to ask why.
Einstein actually said that after studying topics for so long, he could barely stand to look at them for an entire year. George Bernard Shaw described that there was nothing worse for innocent people than the horrible institution of school. Richard Feynman, very notable Nobel Prize winning physicist, described his time in school as an intellectual desert. That should not be the way it is. If this circle represents the body of knowledge that we have, we need to make sure that we encourage our children, our students, to think outside the circle, to explore beyond, to ask those questions that take them outside. Any computer can hold all of the knowledge of that circle within it, but it can't yet ask the questions why that takes you outside of the circle. And we need to make sure that we encourage that as teachers, as educators, as parents. Think outside of it, because you never know where new discoveries will come from. And it's really surprising where innovation arises from, where technology advances. You'd be surprised. Things like personal armor was developed based on the structural properties of shrimp appendages. An adhesive pad that could hold 700 pounds actually came from the study of gecko toe pads. And this is most recent. The promising new diabetes drug that's coming out was based on the study of the composition of Gila monster venom. You have no idea where new discoveries can come from just by being curious. And this funnels into things like basic research. With basic research, things like nylon, Teflon, fiber optics, we can go down and down the list. These things build a base from which other innovations, other technologies come from. MRI is a very interesting one. Before that, there was what was called NMR. MRI, I'm sure everybody in here knows what an MRI is and has probably had one. Can you believe that at the time that the paper was written that won a Nobel Prize, that they actually stated they had no idea that it would have any human value at all? CRISPR is probably one of the most profound biotechnology discoveries that has happened ever. It actually now allows us to rewrite our genomes at will with incredible accuracy. We can now edit out diseases that we have and pass on to our offsprings. Jennifer Doudna, who's at the University of California, Berkeley, she noticed a curious repeating pattern in bacterial genomes and chased it down. She's quoted as saying it is probably the most obscure thing she had ever worked on. So you have no idea where new innovations, new technologies will come from, simply by basic research and being curious. For the past 65 years, the United States has led the world in science and technology. Are we going to maintain this lead? It turns out that every year, our federal budget for basic research goes down. But basic research is the wellspring from which innovation occurs. If we drain the well, will the innovation dry up too? I give many of the tours at Sanford Lab, and I get asked all the time, to the point where I probably roll my eyes. <laughs> what is this good for? This is outside the Myrana Lab. We don't know. We're exploring. It could lead to new understandings of how the universe works. It could lead to quantum computers. It could fail completely. It could force physicists to go back to the drawing board to understand why matter exists in the universe and why we're here. We're exploring. And that is the nature of curiosity. You must explore in the dark. You must ask the questions why, the questions that take you outside of the known knowledge. And I think any child can answer that question. <laughs>